subject, but there will also be, I hope, new ideas. We hope new ideas that goes beyond what is actually uh, the core scope of the Rehide project. So uh, this is just a disclaimer that what we will present here today is not necessarily expected to be a final delivery of the Rehide project, but may go of further into the future. So from the Rehab project, we focused on the neurological disease stroke because this is the most common neurological disease that we see in your rehabilitation. And because of the demographic change that we have and the aging society, this will not get less over time. So we will see more and more patients you know, after a stroke, so the prevalence will increase over time. And stroke, um, and these are really quite new data, uh, is the leading, second most leading cause of death worldwide and the major or one of the major causes of disability. So from what we know from the impairments that stroke patients um, suffer from, we know that 40% of survivors have long-term limitations in activities of daily living, and they often rely on the help of caregivers. We know that the upper limb function is a fundamental part on how to um, use these or how to um, be active in daily life. And of course, this is why we also focus on the upper extremity, upper extremity in the rehab project. So the scope of our talk is to address the question of how we may design and develop an interface for exoskeleton-based stroke rehabilitation that is easy and motivating for the patient to use, that will be engaging for professionals and third party to support the patient best and provide clinical data for therapy planning and continuous optimization of the treatment plan. The key word here being interface, we know in the rehab partner there is a lot of work going on on the design of the exoskeleton itself, the physical part, the hardware, and uh, the software that, that comes with them, the control systems and so on. But all of that will be black box in our common talk. We are not to address this part, but everything else around the exoskeleton and as seen with the perspective of the patient as, as, as the sort of most important part. Just a quick overview of what a patient is going through when he first comes to a hospital. So a patient or a person gets a stroke, he enters a hospital, there's just a couple of days what we would call the acute phase, where he gets treatment to reduce the potential of impairments that comes up um, after a couple of days. And so after just only a few days, and this is the red box here, he comes from the hospital with the acute care into the clinic where we have different options of clinic. So we can have an intensive training option. We have the subacute facility, and we can have some kind of combination between at home and the clinic. We can stay at your home, can come to the clinic and make a treatment, or you can be in the hospital, but have some days where you can experience your home, where you can experience what you actually need and what support you would need when to be able to go home in your former living situation. And as Sandra mentioned this morning, what makes the Rehab Project outstanding is that we would have a focus also on the at-home rehabilitation and the continuity between these two sort of episodes in the patient's journey is an important design challenge for the Rehab Project. 
in order to understand our users needs we started out <laughs> with yeah so that's what we saw in Jan's talk as well uh, so we define some personas that stand for different persons we like we think of targeting with our devices with our modules that we create and that we want to combine and of course it's not a specific stage but it's a continuum of impairments that you have from someone who's really severely affected where maybe there is no upper limb function at all there is no sensitivity at all like really severely affected we would like to target a patient like this and treat the patient we will have someone who's back moderately impaired where we can see some function we can see some minor impairments in sensory uh, function information and of course we have someone that is mildly impaired a patient that's mildly impaired which oh, who has the potential to go home to the home setup or the home setting and it's not just a continuum of time that we see where we hope that impairments get less and less it's also reliant on the site of the stroke where the stroke actually happens and also the volume of the stroke depends on how severely a patient is affected so we need to have both aspects in consideration to think about the importance of our devices we create it depends on the severity and it also depends on the potential someone has to improve their outcome to improve their function now taking a starting point from these personas we mapped out all of the stakeholders around the patients and this is a quite complex picture I don't expect you to see all of the details here but to give a couple of examples what this involves it's of course friends families uh, work place where you used to be uh, insurance companies clinic uh, your own doctor uh, neighbors uh, and the people servicing the uh, technology that you are going to use so a huge number of people are involved in the rehabilitation process of the patient. And this, as we already, already uh, mentioned, is a journey. It's a timeline. And what we have done here is to map out for the different periods at the clinic, at home, but visiting the clinic and completely at the home, what are the main actions, activities that the patient is involved in? What are the emotions that the patient will associate with these different phases? What are the main pains that the patient is experiencing? And again, down here, what are the network? What are the uh, external instances involved in this journey? Focusing on the patient's pains, we did a questionnaire survey on stroke patients in Denmark with more than 120 people replying. And based on their answers to this questionnaire, we were identifying the main pains. This is the four most frequent pains mentioned. Not having enough training, lacking personal understanding from the professionals, not having a complete plan of what was going to happen for me during this rehabilitation journey. And then also that the patient's tiredness was often misunderstood as laziness, not only from family and, and, and people close to them, but also from professionals. The main gains, what really motivated the patient was to see progress, to get guidance and support from therapists and family and social support. 
and getting back to the old job and problems. So this is a kind of the sign goal for us. How can we, when we build this interface for the patient, make sure that this will happen and make this as a drive of the patient to be involved in the rehabilitation process? How can we build an interface with these goals in mind? So when we create something new, we should always think about the existing devices we have. And we heard from Jan, who uh, is with Hakoma, and we have a couple of Hakoma devices in the hospital as well that we use. So we actually, we use the existing information, the existing knowledge, and think about the benefits and what we can improve out of this, and think about new technologies that we can integrate and the modularity that we can use to improve our outcome, to improve the assistance we can give to patients. So we have the AMEO, which is more a device that goes to um, proximal parts of the arm, but we of course have also different forms of impairment and patients, so we can address the hand as well. So it would be nice to combine those aspects, and that's what we are going to do in the um, REAF project. And there are in the at home section, the market, a couple of products coming up. This is a US product called uh, Myomo. Uh, it's supposed to be supporting stroke patients in the daily activities. Um, I don't really know how uh, popular it is, but I know it's got a very high price tag on it. And this is also something for us to consider, would this make, uh, would this technology then at all be accessible to patients who are not on uh, a high insurance coverage or uh, who wouldn't have the means themselves to, to buy this uh, $100,000 uh, piece of technology? I would like to show you now a use case that we have envisioned with a patient five to ten years from now picking up her personal low cost at home exoskeleton and being able to mount it herself. This is a very important design goal. The Donning Dolphin is needed if this patient with just the mobility of one hand should put it on herself. But imagine that we have solved that problem and she can now take it on and she can start using it. In addition, Apple or some of the other manufacturers of smart glasses at that time have produced this smart glass that would make it possible for the patient to have information shown on the glasses while also seeing the space around her and having tracking of her hands done by the glasses. Much of this can be done in a very rude way already, and we are emulating this technology by use of VR headsets. You might have noticed those Pico headsets we demoed yesterday and also Today, we show that they have quite accurate hand tracking, they have eye tracking, and they have IMUs that makes it possible to track the hand so we can interact with the patient or the patient can interact with the exoskeleton by gazing, head gazing, eye gazing, uh, nodding with the hand, talking if she or he masters speech, with the system, we have a lot of opportunities here. And this is the design space that we are now exploring with the use of a bit of autocad technology, which our current or uh, present day uh, head on the best place and, uh, and the whole system. But you should imagine something like this in five to ten years from now. So she will take off the glasses, she will put the glasses on, and she would start walking around in her apartment. 
in the apartment, we have now put up pictures. She had done that herself next to objects that would afford natural, nat natural at home rehabilitation and training, something that's meaningful for her. So when she gets towards the door, she may look at a picture of her grandchild and doing that, the glasses will enlighten this picture and she, she nods that, yes, she would like to interact with the grandchild. The grandchild has made a pre-recording that gets launched in her glasses, and that would encourage her. Hey, Grandma, why don't you open that door 10 times for me? And yes, the grandpa will do this. The idea of having the family, the important people involved in the rehabilitation process is something that came up as one of the main motivators. Talking with the patients at the Shane Clinic, we realized that most family members are very engaged in the very first month, couple of months of a rehabilitation. And then they lose their engagement because progress is probably not happening as fast as they had hoped for. So if we, in these early days, could have a service plan for how to engage the family, get them pre-recorded on something we know would make meaningful exercises at home, we can have the system ready and build up for the patient when we get to the stage where this is going to be done at home. Now, in order to have an idea of what it would mean to be wearing a lightweight, low-cost exoskeleton. We built a Lego version of an exoskeleton to enact, to do what we call body storming of what it means to wear an exoskeleton. So with this, we can do a self active daily activities. The Lego exoskeleton has some very long and a restricted number of, 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 of parts that makes it possible to build this in total in a wireless version that connects uh, to a Unity system that we have developed as well. And all of this is uh, shared on our Rehub uh, GitHub, uh, including a uh, list of the components and a legal manual on how to build the exoskeletons. You can download that and you can have your students or yourself play around with this legal exoskeleton. What it can do is it can bend the elbow and turn the wrist on a command that you execute from the Unity platform. Imagine now we have a patient walking around in her home and wearing these smart glasses. She would then be suggested to do some of the tasks like opening a door. And in this case, this patient is wearing a polar mask uh, headset and she sees that there are some virtual bird some footsteps on the floor. She picks up a real object, a broomer that gets tracked in her glasses, and she is then to do a meaningful activity for her, and she even gets credit for that from the system. Here's another example of what the future may afford us. This is, again, the HoloLens, and what you see here is a person looking at one of these picture QR codes that launches a 
simple task for her, where she would be told to put her hand in these areas, and then because this fork has a special uh, texture, it's easy to see uh, for the uh, tracking system built into the system uh, that where it is, and now she can have a virtual task like eating a piece of cake. And again, this piece of cake could have been baked by her, by her grandchild and put up for her. It may be uh, very easy in the beginning, just four pieces and then she had eaten it. Later on, she would have to take it in very small pieces, like a hundred times before it actually disappears. Using this. <laughs> Um, so, when we think about the system that we are going for, that includes a lot of modules, components, and uh, especially when we go for a disease like stroke, there are so many issues that the patient can have. It's not only motor impairments or sensory impairments. So, we have also some cognitive aspects that can be influenced. And when we think about uh, HoloLens or a different uh, virtual reality classes, um, we know that they can always be problems in perceiving objects in these environments. So we did a first study, and Chiara is here, uh, we performed the study. We did a study on how patients and people who are not able to perceive 3D um, will have the ability of depth perception, how they can perceive the depth and how they like use the information they will see in an augmented reality. Just a short outlook for the study. So we investigated different objects. We had um, like identical objects that had to be matched or the position had to be um, had to be charged for distance and we used different objects that were not in real size and they had to define where the object is positioned in the room and we used of course some clinical tests assessments and correlated this with the outcome of the distance estimation the accuracy of how patients did the distance estimation and we we found out that patients of course they have problems and it's a, we found really more than 50% having issues with spatial perception. So we know that patients with a stroke and specifically those who have issues with 3D perception cannot really perform tests when it comes to the distance estimation in, in the best way. So we know that we now have to work on these issues when we think of using classes in a virtual environment or for therapy. So in the next step, that's what we want to do is to include some of the cues in the environment that will help to better um, to improve the distance estimation for patients. So this is very important uh, learning for us to design these interfaces that should not be made super advanced information in the depth and the sizes of the objects but do it very simple uh, as simple as possible at least for the first versions and for the most severely impacted patients so that said with these five classes we also have a lot of opportunities to have a continuous estimation of the patient's perception of her visual field. So we would, for instance, be able to detect if there is a imminent may patients not paying attention to the one uh, left side of her visual field. And we might compensate for that by then moving objects into the right field. Or we would maybe even help her with uh, some kind of visual means to constantly need to remind her to take attention or pay attention to the whole visual field and not just the half 
just a comment to the gases as well. So I think this is a good uh, example for uh, supply chain because we use the technology that we have in the, in the moment and we add this as a module. But we know in some aspects of our device that we are striving for, we will have more improvements or more uh, sophisticated technology in the next couple of years. That's what the classes uh, showed that John showed earlier. So maybe we have to think about replacing the HoloLens soon to have better technology, not change the entire system, but just change one aspect as a supply chain aspect. Um, I think that is something that we should think also in the rehab project about. And when it comes to the implementation of also software products, we don't have to investigate everything new. That's when we think about the hardware. We have to get everything what is best out of the technology we know so far. And that's also true for the software implementations. So when we think about a product like this, um, which is um, a mixed reality um, device, so the patient actually has maybe the right side or we do it here, the left side is the poetic side. It comes under the screen and the camera, camera is recording the movement of the left side, but it's displayed on the screen as the movement of the right side. And this is something that is used in the hospital and we know it has some good benefits, um, but it's of course limited to a setup and to the hardware of having a screen, having the camera set up. And uh, this is something we know it's a good implementation, so we can make a transfer of existing software into what we are creating new and bring the best things together. And that's what we are trying to do also in the rehab project and implementing this in an AR or in a VR uh, setup. So for instance, uh, we had shown the headset uh, yesterday and today costing 1200 euros that basically provides hand tracking with a very high accuracy and eye gaze tracking. And it would be possible to do the exercises in this headset that we see here being done by costly and big equipment. Um, and this we could do at home with the patient to support mirror exercises, to support uh, pain therapy, uh, to reduce stresses. Lots of opportunities comes up when you can replace or make the brain believe that the good hand is actually uh, being seen as where the bad hand is. Or the, the entire hand. Yeah, nothing like that. In the round with that, um, and in this case, you see a person watching his uh, hand with that exoskeleton on, but you see it without the exoskeleton, which is also, I believe, uh, adventurous from a body ownership perspective, that, that the patient feels that this is my real hand moving, it's not a hand with an exoskeleton. And what we're testing here is what happens if we impact this hand with a ball, would you then sense it more as your real hand if it actually moves in according to where the ball is hitting your hand? And we saw a very significant effect of the trueness of the motion induced on the hand by the exoskeleton compared to when it was done uh, at another location. And this has been reported recently in a paper here um, in the conference on human factors and computer systems, in which you'd also find the links to how you will be able to build this exoskeleton yourself. I will now say a little bit about a core concept of the Riga project, namely the digital twin. As you might have heard, digital twin is becoming more and more common within uh, the industry. 
it's a way to capture or model a lot of the processes that goes on in a complex plant, for instance. And this digital model of the plant makes it possible to do simulations, to have visualizations of the status of the plant, and also to structure new data and capture from this plan. So could we take this whole concept of a digital twin and move it into a digital patient twin? And how can we then include that in the interface concepts that we are building for the media project? This is the question that we have been given by uh, our partners. Now, we would be able with this patient, for instance, to simulate predicting future performance with options in the VR display and with the exoskeleton itself to show the patient how she will be able to control her hand in three months from now if she just keeps doing her daily exercise. And seeing progress was one of the main ways to motivate the patient. Now here we can even predict the progress for the patient to further enhance her motivation to do the exercises. We can also use this digital patient twin to select the most uh, uh, likely successful serious gains for her based on what is her current mobility, we could send out models to play up against computer games and find the one where she would be able to meet the requirements of this game. We would then download the game and we would suggest for her to play this game. Or we would adjust the motor parameters of her exoskeleton that we could make sure that she would be challenged to play this game, but not challenged too much that she wouldn't have any success experience. And we can also, as part of work in progress in this project, start collecting a lot of physiological data from the patient. Not only her performance in the serious games, but also things like heart rate variability, skin conductance, eye movement data, and so on, and build a model of her performance. When is she really engaged? When is she stressed? Are there any indications that she's experiencing pain? Would she do more exercises in the morning than in the evening? All of that, even though we were warned, against having adaptive uh, systems that would change. We truly believe that when you get these personal data, you can optimize with the digital twin much more than we have a teaching program. Also, we are playing around with this notion of a digital coach, someone who can assist you based on his knowledge of your current competence level on doing the most uh, efficient and, 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 and clinically uh, optimal uh, exercises. So imagine in her glasses, she would be seeing this uh, coach coming up and he would show her what kind of motions she should do today. And not only could he show it in a mirror kind of fashion, but he could also be sort of seen as her, or next to her real arm, that would probably make it more uh, easy for her to redo the exercises. And of course, the exoskeleton could assist her in, 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 in uh, having the first uh, uh, trials of, of, of a new exercise. So she could do that. Another possibility would be to use some of the uh, as new uh, means of tracking voice, lips, eye movements, converting that into an avatar that would then interact with the patient. Again, this could be you doing this at home or 
a clinician doing it at uh, the clinic, one patient being at home, and then being an interactive part in Metaverse, serving or having conversations with the patient. This video is one we made to illustrate uh, a set of exercises. It's called the Rehub Cafe, and it's just with written instructions. And of course, some patients would have difficulties reading that, but if you have a voice added to it, that may improve the likelihood that, that she would be able to understand what's going on here. So the basic idea being that, that you could walk around in this cafe and meet different people at the tables that would then have different exercises ready. And in the future that these people you would meet, they would real time be able to act against you and you would see their mouth moving, their head and eyes and so on. We've been testing some of these ideas with patients and clinicians at the Schoen Clinic, and we got some really useful feedback on, on what would work and what would not work in a clinic. And with that as a starting point, we can think of the, how may we transfer from the clinic to the home setting. The final point we would like to make today is that in order to fully support the rehabilitation plan, we should probably also think of a way that we could make sure that the contact between the patient and the clinicians was very regular. And, and we remember this being one of the pain points that they didn't get enough attention from the therapists. Now, if the therapist wouldn't have to move home to the patient, but could do it from distance, Taylor, Rehabilitation becomes a, a really interesting new possibility. We have all learned how to use these TIL technologies within the last couple of years, and also people have tried it out, uh, tested it, and found that uh, the efficiency of TIL rehabilitation was just as big as cleaning in personal. There were no differences in the clinical outcome. Could this be done with this kind of system? You would imagine that. A clinician, a pair of clinicians here, a doctor and therapist are looking into the digital patient of, of the, the digital patient model of, 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 uh, of, of, of our user at home and seeing how she is performing. They could even put on an exoskeleton themselves and feel the motions of the patient at home to have a truly deep understanding of are there any spasms in there or that we should be concerned about? And yeah, maybe they would realize that this could be an issue and then they would increase the uh, FES for the patient the next time that she would be using this. Need to design a whole information system around this, and this is ongoing work, and we again appreciate very much the feedback we get from the clinicians in this first portion of it. Things to consider here is how can we have patients, uh, family involved that would not have a pair of glasses or, or just be looking at the mobile phone to see how it's my grandmother performing today. But of course, uh, also a lot of interest of what would the doctors need to see, how would they prefer to have visualizations of, 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 of the patient's current capabilities. This is actually uh, a digital patient model here, but now it's a uh, 3D model of the patient and, and with some heat maps to show the mobility of the different, different parts of, of, of uh, other, other extremities. Yeah, I think that will conclude our talk. Um, it's probably an uh, inspiration to think of, could we come up with a technology that would actually make it possible for stroke patients to do something that they have never ever been able to do before they got a stroke. <laughs> that could sort of be a, a part of the world. So, Chocolate, for instance, you can do that in virtual. You can learn how to do that in virtual reality because you can just slow down on gravity. 
Maybe we could think of something for that for it to scout in such a way. Do you have a final word? Um, I think that was excellent. Mm -hmm. That was a final word. Thanks, Dr. Thanks, thanks to you. Um, okay, are there any questions, comments, wishes? Probably we can also be in the wish list. Yes. <laughs> I have a question. Um, it's very interesting, and I also see the relevance of this integration. And I know the rehype is also about integration, but also if you look at the state of the technology, how do you, and if you have compare, let's say, robotics and AR, VR, but what do you see first move into the home? What, what do you think that it must be a joint concept? Or can we currently already work at home with VR? Because robots are always dangerous moving. Yeah. So, I, I, I think that AR VR will come first because it's all digital and we can use commodity hardware that we already have. Here. And we can use uh, objects at home that would afford the adaptation. Uh, the cards, the tray, uh, door handles, the broom. Uh, and we might even think of the whole uh, ways to put up an arm in, 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 in just uh, something in, in, in a pair of strings that would, would hold it. And, and with that extra support, you, you could have a, a lot of interesting exercises. Not all the uh, support from a, a table, and as, as is common for some of the exercises. Would be um, kind of my answer too uh, that this is something we can bring into our homes first because we already have game making uh, situations that patients can use or customers can use when they go home. So, like the we we were talking about before, that's already available, and we try to adapt it in a way. It's not always easy because. Uh, it is made for healthy subjects and it not fits really the needs of a patient with impairments. Um, but we have to be sure that we can just address a small portion of patients or customers with this. And uh, we need to have some form of combined robotic uh, VR electrical simulation system. So to address the other um, patients which are mightily impaired or severely impaired, they will not have the opportunity to use the system or to gain. They can use it with their unaffected hand when they are capable of from the cognitive side. Uh, they can have fun and use this as a cognitive tool, but that would not help to improve the motor function. Did you get any experience with the Lego EXO with Patients, could that be a solution for developing countries as a low price solution in a non medical market? I would not recommend that. Uh, it's, it, it, it's quite bulky and, and it, it's difficult to mount and made of legal, it, it falls apart. But what I would do, I would probably do the very first prototype. And then move on to 3D printing uh, the main pieces. And talking about modularity, look for motors that's already out there for mass mind. And we took the one for, for, for Lego because it was just powerful enough to induce some kind of you could, I'm, I'm sure you'll find other modules of motors that you could connect open source to, to a system. So that would be my way to go, but not use this one. It's not for clinical use at all. No. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank yes, you both. Oh, sure. um, your last uh, interview with the Jamie was very interesting. Uh, I'm kind of wondering: Are you saying that you will be able to give the patient more functionality than they had? Both trauma? For some uh, elderly patients, that may be true, yes. And, and at least we could have the patients to get new interests. We are following a golf club of 
of stroke survivors in Denmark. And, and not only are they a group of people who used to play golf before they got a stroke, but they are actually able to attract other people who have never played golf before. And yes, they're playing golf with one hand, and some of them with a sort of extra piece on, 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 on the golf club in order to do so. But the motivation for them to get there and meet other golf uh, well, stroke survivors actually gets them into playing golf as an interesting, new, and meaningful uh, life activity. So, so. Okay, thanks. Thanks.